In the early 1980s, I worked as a reactor physicist for the UK's Atomic Energy Authority. I left after a few years and followed a different career, but I've continued to be interested in nuclear power and I've kept up with the important and revolutionary developments that have been taking place. It's these revolutionary changes in nuclear power that I want to talk about. In the early 1980s, people were just beginning to become concerned about global warming, but nevertheless, nuclear power was unpopular due to concerns about safety, nuclear waste disposal and cost. A lot has changed since then, and it's now possible to make completely safe nuclear power stations that actually consume nuclear waste instead of producing it. And this can be done with no risk of the fuel being used to make nuclear weapons. There are several ways of doing this and multiple new reactor designs have been proposed. But I want to focus on the stable salt reactor designed by Moltex Energy because this design solves all of the problems associated with nuclear power and has a realistic chance of bringing about a significant reduction in global warming. I'd like to point out that I have no financial interest in Moltex Energy or any other nuclear power company. My motivation is simply to help to protect our environment. There are 23 slides and a short video clip in this presentation. I'll talk first about the problems and then go on to the solutions and I'll take any questions afterwards if that's all right. Okay, so that I can explain all this, I want to first say a bit about uranium, which is a fuel most commonly used for nuclear power. Natural uranium that's dug out of the ground consists mostly of two types mixed together. Uranium with 235 nuclear particles in each atom and uranium with 238 nuclear particles in each atom. The uranium-235 is the useful type that we can use to make nuclear power, but there isn't much of it in a block of uranium. The uranium-238 just gets in the way by absorbing the neutrons that cause the nuclear reactions. All the uranium on our planet was made a long time ago in a star that exploded before our sun existed. And ever since the uranium was made, the uranium-235 has slowly been decaying into atoms of lead. At about the time that multicellular life first appeared on Earth, uranium-235 formed about 3% of the uranium. Now it only forms about 0.7%. Uranium-235 is the type that can split apart, releasing energy and releasing neutrons, some of which hit other uranium-235 atoms, causing them to split apart making more energy and so on, creating a chain reaction that gives us nuclear power. Uranium-238 just absorbs the neutrons without splitting or making energy, and that stops the chain reaction happening. So if a block of uranium doesn't have enough uranium-235 in it, then a nuclear reaction isn't possible. To make nuclear power, we can enrich the uranium by removing some of the uranium-238 to artificially increase the percentage of uranium-235 and we can also slow the neutrons down using what's called a moderator. Slow neutrons aren't absorbed by the uranium-238 so easily. So I hope you've got the idea. It's this small bit of uranium, the uranium-235, that makes the energy. The rest just gets in the way. About two billion years ago, when there was more uranium-235 than there is now, so it's easier for nuclear reactions to take place, there were at least 17 natural nuclear reactors operating in West Africa. This photo shows some scientists standing around looking at the remains of some of these natural nuclear reactors. When it rained on the ground, the rainwater acted as a moderator, slowing the neutrons down so they weren't absorbed by the uranium-238. And that meant that the neutrons could cause fission of uranium-235 atoms and a nuclear chain reaction started up. Of course, it very quickly got hot and the water evaporated, so the reaction stopped until the ground became wet enough for it to start again. All 17 of these reactors ran like this for about a million years without ever having an overheating incident because this control mechanism, based on the physics of the configuration, was fundamentally safe. The reactors, the reactors had what we call a negative void coefficient, meaning that if the coolant disappears, the reactor stops. I'll come back to this later on. Anyway, I think it's interesting that there used to be nuclear reactors on Earth before humans were around. I don't think many people know that. But let me get back to more recent times. So now I've explained a bit about uranium, I want to talk about the problems and how they've been solved. There were three serious problems with nuclear power in the 1970s. How to dispose of nuclear waste, how to make reactors safe, and the overall cost of nuclear power. 
It's only recently that they've all finally been solved. So currently, nuclear power stations use just the tiny amount of uranium-235, but in doing so, they contaminate all of what was harmless uranium-238 with nuclear ashes. The proper term is fission products, but I think that nuclear ashes is more descriptive. These nuclear ashes remain dangerous for 300 years. The other thing that contaminates uranium at this stage is the various actinides that are formed in the reactor. Actinides are elements like plutonium, which are near uranium in the periodic table, and many remain dangerously radioactive for 100,000 years or more. This is a big part of the problem with current nuclear power. We use a tiny amount of uranium, just the uranium-235, and we end up with a large amount of radioactive mess mis mixed in with uranium-238. There is no completely certain way of storing this high-level waste for 100,000 years. There are various plans for underground storage, but none have ever been put into action, and all of the world's high-level nuclear waste is currently stored in temporary storage facilities, such as the pond shown in this slide. Incidentally, the blue light is produced by the nuclear waste, which is emitting particles into the water at over the speed of light in water. It's the equivalent of a sonic boom from an aircraft going over the speed of sound, but it's from particles going over the local speed of light instead. The waste carries on producing this light for many years. Beautiful but dangerous. Another problem with traditional nuclear power is the possibility of an accident. The first thing I want to say about this is that nuclear power stations can't blow up like a nuclear bomb. It simply isn't possible because of the uranium-238. The fuel required to make a nuclear bomb is highly specialised and very pure with almost no uranium-238 present. However, other types of explosion, steam pressure in the case of Chernobyl, or a hydrogen and oxygen explosion at Fukushima and at Chernobyl, are possible. And then, as a result of the explosion, radiation leaks can occur. Nearly all nuclear reactors contain the fuel in fuel pins, shown on, uh, similar to the one shown on the right in this slide. Highly radioactive cesium and iodine gases build up at high pressure in the fuel pins due to the nuclear fission. This is the danger in a nuclear accident. If these gases escape due to a core meltdown or chemical explosion, then large areas of land can be dangerously contaminated. This is what happened at Chernobyl and Fukushima and nearly happened at Three Mile Island too. I just want to have a quick aside here because I don't think it's widely known that both the Chernobyl and Fukushima accidents were predicted by the UK's Atomic Energy Authority in the late 70s. When I worked for the Atomic Energy Authority, the safety experts requested the Soviets to close down all of the Chernobyl-type reactors because the design was dangerous. Chernobyl was an accident waiting to happen. The design was cheap to build but was unsafe. It had a positive void coefficient, meaning that in the event that coolant was lost, the reactivity would increase. This is the opposite to the natural reactors found in West Africa. They ran for a million years without overheating because they had a negative void coefficient. Also, there wasn't a secondary containment building around the reactor to stop gases escaping in the event of a core breach. This type of reactor would never have been licensed in the UK. Both the UK's Tom Kenji Authority and the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission advised the Japanese to tsunami-proof the Fukushima reactors by raising the height of the sea defence wall. The worry was that in the event of a large tsunami, the boiling water reactors might lose their electrical supply and that the backup generators weren't high enough above sea level, and therefore they might fail to start, and the core would then overheat. Unfortunately, the changes were never implemented. Boiling water reactors rely on an emergency power backup being available to keep the core cool for several days after shutdown. My colleagues at the Atomic Energy Authority said that this wasn't good enough, especially as the backup generators were too close to sea level. It would have been much better if the reactors had been fundamentally safe instead of relying on safety system, uh, systems working properly to keep them safe. So in both cases, the, accident that the accidents that happened were predicted in detail by the UK's Atomic Energy Authority many years before they happened. Nuclear reactors should be designed to be inherently safe. They should have walkaway safety, which means that whatever happens, no corrective action is required and the reactor cannot be dangerous. Cost has also been a major concern. If nuclear is too expensive, then it won't form a major part of the world's energy supply. 
and therefore it won't make much difference to climate change. Hinkley Point C has been built to fill the near-term gap in our baseload electricity generation, but it's very expensive. Expensive power stations will never be built in sufficient, in sufficient numbers to solve global warming. OK, so now I want to explain how these problems have all been solved. It's nearly 70 years since the start of the nuclear power industry, and there are many new reactor designs which are far superior to the original concepts. There are designs that both clean up nuclear waste and are inherently safe in operation. Many of them have come about because of the Integral Fast Reactor, or IFR, research program in the US. This was the first reactor design that could convert dangerous nuclear waste into a much safer form. An, an experimental IFR was built in the 1980s at the Argo National Labs in Idaho in the US and then further development developed in the early 1990s. It operated successfully for several years, but the program was stopped in 1994 for non-technical reasons by a US government which was at the time against nuclear power. The next slide is a short video showing Dr. Charles Hill, the program director for the IFR, talking about the inherent safety of the reactor. Back in the 80s, it was clear to me that something had to be done. Something better than present day. About safety. And it wasn't only in safety. It was in um, matters of waste as well, and in uh, uh, proliferation matters, uh, and over all of those things, uh, the matter of economics. You can't make the plant impossibly expensive by making it too complicated. Let's go ahead and go up to the main parking lot there then. All right, thanks very much. So, in 1980, I was given the job of directing the entire program of advanced reactor development at Argonne National Laboratory. Our goal was to design a new type of reactor where the very physics of it would be such that it could withstand almost any type of accident that nuclear plants can be subject to. It was called the IFR, the Integral Fast Reactor. The budget was about $100 million a year. 1,500 people, scientists, engineers, supporting staff, this was a very big development program. But you've got to test it. Calculations don't tell you everything. You've got to have the big facilities that say, if we have an accident of this kind, what will happen? We will now start to set up for the test. We did two experiments to demonstrate some unique safety features that that reactor has that others don't have and invited people from all over the world to come and witness it. T minus two minutes. Station blackout is a term that's used by NRC, the safety folks, to describe the situation where one loses all bulk AC power. You assume that you lose off-site power. You assume that you're getting no AC power from your own turbo generator. You assume that your first diesel started up and it failed to start up. The second one started to start up and it did also fail. So you end up dead in the water with no AC power. This experiment was almost a direct parallel to what happened at Fukushima. It was eerily similar. We ran a reactor at full power, disabled the shutdown system, so the operators had no ability to shut the reactor down. And we shut off the cooling system, didn't extract the heat, so we just let things get hotter. In most reactors, you can't do it. No reactor I know of would survive that accident, but you have a meltdown. The international audience were watching the temperature going up like that, straight up. They turned around like so to see if I was or if the Argonne guys were running. <laughs> By the time they looked up again, the, uh, the trace had turned like so and it was on its way down and uh, the reactor just quietly shut itself down. No action required of the operators no action required of the safety systems, nothing. You could just stand back like this, watch the dials if you wished, and the reactor shut itself down. 30 seconds. 30 seconds till test time. Well, in the afternoon, we started the reactor up again, 
and carried out the conditions responsible for the accident at Three Mile Island. We shut off the pumps. Just shut off the pumps. All major reactor accidents happen because of one thing, inadequate cooling. The IFR type reactor, which EBR2 was a prototype for, if you cut it off from the steam system so it cannot reject its heat, it will just shut itself down. So it can't melt down? No, it can't melt down. So, the video shows that a reactor such as the IFR that has a negative reactivity coefficient won't overheat. The IFR also burns up waste, but it's unlikely that many will be built. This is because the economic case is probably not strong enough, and it's also partly because opponents of the design worry about a fire risk from the liquid sodium coolant. Anyway, there are now various designs which approve upon the IFR concept and which don't use liquid sodium as a coolant. So, in order to really make a difference to global warming, new reactors must have the good characteristics of the IFR, i.e. converting nuclear waste into a safer form, and have the inherent safety of its negative reactivity coefficient but they must also be so cheap that electricity companies want to buy and operate them. Also, the reactor must be capable of producing enough power to replace large conventional power stations. And ideally, it should be able to respond very quickly to changes in power requirements so that it can operate in partnership with intermittent renewable sources of electricity and so that it can meet sudden changes in demand. The stable salt reactor meets all of these requirements. It's based on the same general principles as the IFR and has many similar characteristics, but it'll be much cheaper to build and operate. It uses liquid salt, just like table salt, as a coolant, and the fuel is dissolved in further liquid salt that help, that's held inside the fuel pins. The stable salt reactor takes the nuclear waste that we talked about earlier and processes it using an electro-refining system and then burns it as fuel. The end products are a huge amount of electricity and nuclear ashes. The nuclear ashes only need to be stored for 300 years because after that their radiation will have dropped down to background levels so they're no longer dangerous. There are easy ways of storing waste safely for 300 years so disposing of the nuclear ashes isn't a problem. Now, because nearly everything in the big blue column is used to make power, a lot more electricity is made than was made when the fuel was first used. About 100 times as much, in fact. It's worth thinking about that for a moment. The stable salt reactor will take waste from our nuclear power stations and make 100 times as much electricity as the conventional nuclear power station made when it produced the waste in the first place. That's a huge amount of electricity. In fact, if stable salt reactors were used to destroy all of the UK's existing nuclear waste, they would produce enough electricity to meet 100% of the UK's electricity demand for the next 400 years at the current rate of use of electricity, simply by using up the nuclear waste. There are two critical processes that are required to make this happen. The first is the splitting of the waste into the nuclear ashes, the actinides and the uranium. This is done using an electro-refining process. It's this process that means that the dangerous actinides can be put back into the reactor and burnt as fuel. This slide shows the existing dangerous nuclear waste that we've talked about in the bottom left corner. This is fed into the electro-refiner where the nuclear ashes are separated out and stored safely for 300 years. The remaining mix is then put into the stable salt reactor where some of the useless uranium-238 becomes converted into useful fuel, as I'll explain in the next slide. The waste from the stable salt reactor then goes back into the electro refiner and the process goes round and round multiple times until all we have left is nuclear ashes. The nuclear ashes from all the electricity generation for a person's lifetime would be the size of a golf ball. And of course, after just 300 years, it's completely safe to handle, so safe disposal isn't a problem. The second critical aspect is that inside the stable salt reactor, the uranium-238, which forms the majority of the waste, 
is gradually converted into plutonium-239, which is one of the actinides that the stable salt reactor uses as fuel. This is why we get so much energy from the waste. Nearly all of the uranium is gradually used up like this, instead of just using the small amount of uranium-235. Incidentally, the electro-refining process can't separate out plutonium-239 from the other actinides. This is important because it means that the process is not suitable for producing nuclear weapons. Just like the integral fast reactor that we saw in the video, the stable salt reactor becomes less reactive as it becomes hotter, so it simply can't overheat. There can't be a meltdown. It's so stable that it doesn't even need an operator to control it. It just controls itself by virtue of its design. If the main cooling pumps that send the hot salt to the steam raisers were to stop, then the reactor would always cool itself by natural convection of the air out, uh, around the outside of the reactor. Cool air from outside is drawn in and warm air is expelled by natural convection. And importantly, in the stable salt reactor, there are no dangerous gases in the fuel pins because the, the cesium and iodine are dissolved in the molten salt as soon as they are produced. So there can't, there can't possibly be a leak of gases. There aren't any radioactive gases to leak. The concept of radioactive contamination of large areas of land just doesn't exist with this reactor. Unlike most reactors in use around the world, a stable salt reactor can't have, a, have steam explosions or a hydrogen explosion because no water is used in the reactor. A liquid sodium fire also isn't a risk because the coolant is table salt which can't catch fire. And probably the most important point about the stable salt reactor is that it's cheaper to build and operate than coal power stations, so electricity companies will want to build them. The stable salt reactor is very small compared to, to traditional reactors. It will be made in a factory and delivered to the site on a lorry. None of the pipework outside the reactor vessel becomes radioactive, so maintenance of the steam turbine side of things is simple. The reactor itself does not become very radioactive in operation, so decommissioning at the end of life is much easier than with a conventional nuclear reactor. Detailed studies by an independent body have shown that the Stable salt reactor is very cheap to build and operate, cheaper than any fossil fuel power station. And the fuel is free because companies that store nuclear waste will pay the operator of a stable salt reactor to take the waste away. That payment will cover the cost of the electro refining process. The stable salt reactor is load following, which means that if the electricity demand increases, then the reactor produces more power. And if the demand decreases, then the reactor slows down. There are no moving parts required to do this. It's simply the physics of the design. Because the molten salt is very hot, at around 600 degrees, it can also be used to heat up additional molten salt in an insulated storage tank when demand is low. And then the storage tank can be used to produce electricity at the times of high demand. And for this reason, it fits well with the intermittent renewable sources of electricity. When renewables are providing enough electricity on their own, the stable salt reactor can heat up the storage tanks. And when renewables aren't doing so well, the reactor can power the grid with the help of heat from the storage tanks. This makes the system very flexible and particularly fast in responding to demand changes. Old, car, um, old coal power stations can have the dirty coal burning part removed and replaced with a much smaller stable salt reactor. The reactor is so safe that a safety zone around the reactor isn't required. The operating cost will be lower than when burning fuel because there's no need to pay for fuel. The train loads of coal can stop. If you consider how the world's electricity is currently produced, it's obvious that to stop global warming, the fossil fuel power stations have to be replaced and the stable salt reactor is an easy way of doing this quickly. This chart shows a recent cost comparison of various methods of producing electricity. The stable salt reactor by Moltex would come in at the very bottom as the cheapest form of continuous power generation. No stable salt reactors have yet been built, but Moltex are working with New Brunswick Power and expect to have the first stable salt reactor in service in Canada between 2028 and 2030. Moltex say that in the UK, the first one could be in service by 2032. 
If hundreds of these reactors are to be built around the world, it would make a significant difference to climate change, but this is unlikely to happen without public support. So it's important that people become aware of the benefits of this new type of nuclear power. To summarise, modern nuclear power can get rid of our existing nuclear waste, be completely safe, make electricity very cheaply, and work well with intermittent renewable sources. We could have a near future in which by far the majority of the world's energy comes from safe, modern nuclear power. Transportation, industry, heating and so on can all be powered by electricity. The few exceptions, such as long-haul aircraft and shipping, could be powered by electrofuels, i.e. fuels produced by electricity. So I don't know if there are any questions, and that's all I wanted to say. There's a suggested reading list here for anyone who'd like to investigate the subject further. I'll go back to the normal Zoom mode now and try to answer any questions that you might have.